All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so we're going to have two different videos for today, Wednesday morning. Um, and I'll tell you all the stuff in just a second. So let's go through the docket. Um, I hope you all had um, a really good Tuesday. <laughs> I was thinking it was the weekend. What day is it? Oh my God, COVID. Okay. So Monday, what did we go through? Well, we went through KSP and KF and we went through thermal K and Q. We did not get to dilute acids and polyprotic acids. So we're gonna go ahead and move those down um, to today. We're also gonna cover acid um, strength, so at looking at the structure and then predicting the strength of the acid, as well as acidic and basic salts, um, and end with a common ion effect. Friday is going to be entirely reserved for buffers and titrations. Um, we will very briefly talk about titrations. Um, so we will we'll cover that much more in depth, um, actually, in your lab, your labs that you'll be having um, that cover titration. Okay, so what do you guys? So just to remind you, Monday of an exam. To prepare for that, you have two smart works coming up due. One, the equilibrium smart work that is due on um, tonight at 11.59 p.m. And then you have your acid-based smart work that is due Sunday night before you take the exam. Um, I do wanna do some kind of electronic review session. I don't really know what this is gonna look like, but it should be fun. I'm sure we'll figure it out. Um, I will try to get your review um, for you posted. Oh, let's say tomorrow, today is really insane. Um, online teaching thing is it's like really hard. Okay, um, and then top hat questions. You guys, um, make sure you're staying on top of those. We have seen a drop off in top hat responses, which probably just means I need to pull in numerics into your grade book so you can see how much that's affecting your grade. Um, do your questions. You have a pre-lab quiz in the lab. That's all on the lab canvas. You just need to interact with that module. Most of you are getting it. Um, we have a lot of the pre-lab quizzes turned in already, um, so it seems to be going okay. You do need to like dive into that module. Um, I would highly recommend like watching a few of the videos, reading the stuff to know how to do that pre-lab. Um, yeah, watch the videos, they're really helpful. Um, it kind of walks you through exactly what you have to do. Um, when you do M1V1 equals M2V2, don't forget that like what you're actually ending with is like a dilution of your stock concentration. Okay. If you haven't watched the videos, that probably doesn't make sense to you at all. But um, watch the videos, or you're probably getting your pre lab quiz wrong. Okay. The worksheet for acids and bases is posted now. It's due Friday at 11.59 p.m. You can come hang out with me tomorrow at 10 a.m. or Jen at 7 p.m. Um, and do that in group work. The reading for Friday to cover buffers and titrations, that's the reading for each one of the um, individual editions. So check that out read it. Um, yeah, and then maybe I'll post some kind of like summary for sections for your exam too. Okay, so some memes today. So we've been talking a lot about acid-based chemistry, um, and I found some like ones that I really enjoy. Okay, so water can be both a Lewis base and a Lewis acid. And then this other guy turns just like, wait, it's H3O water. And then that Leonardo DiCaprio is like, what is wrong with you, bro? It's H2O. It's how I feel when people ask me to calculate molecular weight when they've been in general chemistry for the entire year. Just so you know. What? How do you not know this? Everyone forgets things sometimes. I understand. But that's, that's one you should know. Okay. Water. It's H2O. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, I always like to make like drug acid jokes during this chapter um, and hallucinogenics in general, I find it entertaining. Um, there's also like a very cool um, chemistry um, developing LSD document or like hallucinogenics in general documentary out there that like you should totally check out. Essentially, it's a bunch of synthetic organic chemists that were like making all these molecules and then being like, is this hallucinogenic? I don't know. Let me taste it. And you'd be like, is that in the 1800s? I'm like, no, bro. That was in the 60s. <laughs> um, so have I seen your LSD? No, I haven't seen your LSD. Have you seen the fucking dragons in the kitchen? 
Yeah, that's amazing. Okay. Um, <laughs> I hope you like that too. And then uh, base, proton, and acid. So the acid, remember, is always giving up the proton to the base. Who's lording over it all? Just kidding. I don't know. But the acid really does give the proton to the base. Okay, so I wanted to actually start today with a top hat question. Um, so I threw in an extra slide. And then what we need to think about is how we can relate pKa and acid strength. So the question is, which is most acidic? I ask you about three different acids, and then I give their pKa's. Now, if you um, were smart and memorized all the strong um, acids and strong bases that I asked you to, do that for your exam. Um, you could look at this immediately and you could be like, I don't even know anything about PK. Okay, sure, cool, great, PK. Um, you're right, it's the right one. But if you do want to know how to relate PK and acid strength, which comes up on your worksheet, um, let me show you. So remember that the P, I'm feeling kind of feisty today. Sorry, this should be a fun lecture. So the PKA is P is negative log. Okay, all right, and then 10 to the negative pKa equals, that's right, right? Yeah, yes, equals K. Okay, cool. Okay, so what we're going to do for each one of these is find their K, and then we're going to see which one's biggest, right? Because the biggest K is the strongest acid, because the biggest K means you're producing the most H plus or H3O plus. Either way, it's totally fine. You can shorthand it, say H plus, write it all out, write H3O. Remember that when you do base hydrolysis, so a base reacting with water, in that reaction, you have to have the water for that reaction to make sense. So you can't shortcut the base hydrolysis, but you can shortcut um, the acid reaction. Okay, so we have 10 to the negative of the negative, so the positive, 6.3. I accidentally wrote this as 6.2, so let me grab my calculator. 10 up 6.3, and you get a super huge number. One, two, three, four, five, six. It is equal to 1.995. I know it's too many sick things. Times 10 to the sixth power. That's what I think I'm getting. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yes. Okay, so giant K, that should make sense because it's a strong acid. Okay, we have HSO4, take 10 to the negative 1.92, and that's going to equal 0 0.0120, and that's my concentration of H. Plus. No, oh, shoot. No, it's not. That's my KA. Oh my goodness. Okay, and then the last one is 10 to the negative 10.33. And that equals 4.7 times 10 to the negative 11. So what you're seeing here is C is a species that's not going to produce very much H plus at all, right? The reverse reaction is actually favored because um, it's less than one for K. The reverse reaction is also favored for HSO4 minus, making both of those weak acids, okay? Remember that if it's less than one, it's going to be a weak acid, all right? So not very much H plus is going to be produced with both of those. And then if we think about HCl, a ton of H plus is going to be produced. So that means HCl is by far most acidic. Okay. All right. Let's talk about um, dilute acids and bases and what happens with those. But I first need to go to my chapter 15 slide deck. And scroll down. <laughs> There we go. Okay. Um, like, like your soul. Okay. Auto ionization of water plays a role in pH. So essentially, what happens is if you look at a really dilute solution, so let's say a solution that is. <laughs> um, yeah, let's do this one. What is the pH? 
of 2.0 times 10 to the negative 9 molar HNO3. HNO3 is a strong acid. You should recognize uh, nitric acid. Okay. I'm going to take the, so since this is a strong acid, I guess it's just strong acid. Fully dissociates. What that means is that my concentration of HNO3, since it all falls apart into H plus, is equal to my concentration of H plus. That's super nice with strong acids. That's why we need to know that they're strong acids so we treat them appropriately. And we're going to take pH equals negative log that concentration H plus, which is equal to our concentration HNO3, so 2.0 times 10 to the negative 9 molar. Remember, that's just because HNO3 is a strong acid. This is not for all acids. You have to do your ice tables with all those weak ones. Okay, so if I do this, I'm going to get a pH equal to 8.70. What? I added a strong acid, and my solution is basic. Remember, anything above 7 is a base, right? Yikes. How is that possible? Okay, it's not actually true. Um, so in my notes, what I have is basic WTF. So usually I take you through all the math. Jen doesn't uh, cover this as in depth as I normally do. So I'm gonna um, abbreviate and just tell you that what we need to consider is that auto ionization of water. So remember at the very beginning of acids and bases, I told you that H2O through auto ionization is gonna fall apart. And really, it's two H2Os, right? So one's going to form an H3O plus, and one's going to form an OH minus. So what is true is that this initial concentration of OH in this situation is impacting my overall pH because I'm at a dilute enough concentration. Remember I said if I were perfectly at a pH of 7, what's going to be true is that this is 1.0 times 10 to the negative 7th. That's my concentration of, of H3O. Concentration of OH is also 1.0 times 10 to the negative seventh. If I was at seven, which I'm not at seven, okay? But let's just say, if I was at seven, these would be the concentrations. But I just wanna show you the order of magnitude that we're kind of talking about here. So that's what we have for our concentration of OH minus at seven. So when does this autoionization or the concentration of H3O plus and OH minus that's naturally in the solution actually impact my pH? When I'm at wicked low concentrations. So if you look at concentration that I started with here, it's 2.0 times 10 to the negative ninth. That's super tiny. So I basically have like almost none in there at all. Okay, so what you would find out if you go through and do the ice table and the calculations for this question is that now if we also account for the H plus, sorry, you need to account for both these guys really. So if you also account for the H plus that's in solution because of auto ionization of water, you end up getting um, a pH of 6.99 at the end of the day, okay? So this is a situation where it's just barely acidic. I won't make you work through any problems for dilute acids, but I do want you to know that if we're in really low concentrations, so in the, say like plus or minus, well, definitely minus, but if we're greater than 10 to the minus seven, or we're like we're hanging around there, I usually tell my students times 10 to the minus five is your magic number. So if you're times 10 to the minus five, I guess I should write that, times 10 to the minus five. So if you're greater than times 10 to the minus five for your concentration, autoionization of water will not play a part.
but if you're lower than that 10 to the minus 5 for the concentration, it will. So the types of questions that you could get about this is, I mean, a really dilute solution of, you know, NaOH, but I did my, like, PO, or I, I figured out that my actual pH is acidic. Why could that be? And your answer would be, you're not accounting for the autoionization of water. Like, you need to if you're, like, below 10 to the minus 5 for concentration. Okay? All right, let's talk about polyprotic acids. Um, so, in polyprotic acids, we just have more than one ionizable proton. Um, this could be like H2SO4, H3PO4, and these are just examples. H2CO3. I use H2CO3 in like tons of examples. Um, it's one of my favorite because it is like nature's natural buffer and we'll talk about buffers next time. Um, but also that it plays such a huge part in our lives um, is why I pick uh, H2CO3 a lot. But phosphate is also a really important biological buffer um, and an important acid in our bodies. So what is true is you should be able to look at each one of these and say like, what's the proticity, um, which is a weird word for how many protons does the thing have? You just look here, highlight your protons, say H2SO4, it's got two, so it's diprotic. H3PO4, it's got three, so it's triprotic. H2CO3, it's got two, diprotic. How many protons can it possibly give away to base? That's what we're looking at here. Something to note is that each proton has a very different Ka value. So it becomes more and more challenging to rip those hydrogens away as you give more up. That should make sense because I'm changing the charge, right? And I'll show you that. But essentially, it's more difficult to rip a positively charged thing away from something that's already formally negatively charged. So let's go through H3PO4 just because there's three different iterations of that one. So if I have H3PO4, I'm going to shorthand this. So I'm not going to include the H2O. You can if you want to. But H plus aqueous plus H2PO4 minus AQ. So note that I'm forming a species that is negatively charged. All right, so then I start with that negatively charged species on the next one that can still give up another proton. So H2PO4, AQ, so an equilibrium, with H plus, plus HPO4, two minus, HPO4 to minus in equilibrium with H plus AQ plus PO4 three minus. Okay, so what should make sense is that it's actually really hard to take away the hydrogen from HPO4, right? Because it has a two negative charge, and then you're forming like three negative charge and charges don't necessarily love to exist in nature, okay? So if we think about even just the first two Ka values and how those numerics change, um, if we look at Ka1, so my Ka for one is 7.11 times 10 to the negative three. Okay, so weak acid, but like not, um, like super, super weak as far as weak acids go. And then if you look at Ka2, it's dramatically changed. So you go 6.32 times 10 to the negative 8. And this is like 1, 2, 3. Those different reactions. So I'm not even going to write Ka3. So what you should already be able to see is that as we go 
from losing one proton to losing three proton or losing two protons, you've dropped um, five orders of magnitude and the amount that that's gonna go forward, okay? So it becomes much less favorable as you continue to go on. All right. So we actually started with this pKa and acid strength question. Let me go over to your top hat. Make sure that's true. Yep. So we are not going to do this right now. Whoops. I kicked off class with that question. Okay. So I do want to show you this diprotic acid situation, like um a calculation along with it. I am also shortening this because John doesn't cover it in depth. Um, but uh, vitamin C diprotic, what is the pH of this solution? And I give you the K1 and I give you the K2. So what we should be able to think about is that this Ka1 and 2, these fall in line with what we would expect, right? The second one is much smaller than the first one. It's not as favorable to rip that second proton off. Well, let's write down the ascorbic acid equation. So we have H2, C6, H6, O6, it's an equilibrium, H plus, plus HC6, H6, O6, minus. So that's ascorbic acid becoming deprotonated. What actually is nice here is we could write out the second equation as well, but what you should note is that this Ka2 is super, super small. Um, so when you take analytical chemistry, I, will, I would love to take you through <laughs> multiple iterations of um, even like a triprotic system where you do three ice tables on top of each other and then you add together the um, H plus concentration that comes from each one to get a total H plus concentration, and you take the negative log of that to give you your pH. Um, we're going to stick to just thinking about one ice table, and I'm actually going to show this the shorthand um, equation for finding a Ka value. So let's go over what we're ignoring here, or an assumption that we're making. Say Ka2 is super small. Assume it produces a negligible amount of H plus. Okay, so now that this is down, negligible amount of H plus. Let's do um, the shortcut for Ka um, as this example. So what you need to remember when you're doing the shortcut is there's two assumptions that come in. One, that my concentration of H plus is equal to my concentration of H6, H6, O6. Wait, what does that even mean? That means we produce equal amounts of this H plus as well as this, which is the A minus in this case, right? This is the case if you're at any kind of reasonable concentrations, which we are, we're at 0.250. Now, if there were the other species floating around um, in solution, we would be working on a systematic equilibrium problem, which we are not going to teach, definitely not teaching um, in general chemistry. Here, we only think about one species um, and having it fall apart. But that's not real water. Real water is like very complex equilibrium and super fun. Okay, the other assumption is that H2, or the concentration of H2C6, H6, O6, is equal to my concentration of H2, C6, H6, O6, initially minus X. So what this is telling me is however much I started with of this vitamin C in solution, I'm just gonna subtract out however much H plus was formed. That should make sense, right? I'm thinking about how much of this species do I have, but I need to make sure that I do is subtract out 
any of this species that was created. Okay. So let's go ahead and do that. So the Ka expression for this reaction is HC6, H6O6 minus, there's H plus. Now I know in acid base, sometimes you forget about the coefficients situation because everything is one, because we're always talking about one proton being exchanged. But don't forget if you do have coefficients, you need to account for those in your mass action expression. Oh, where are my products? H2C6, H6, O6. This take on the form, since both of these are equal to each other, the H plus as well as the A minus species, we're just going to say this is x squared. And this is 0 0.250 minus x. That came from this over here. Okay. All right, now let's work it through. So we have 1.0 times 10 to the minus five. Where'd that come from? Came from right here, okay. So that's my Ka times 10 to the minus five. Whoa. And that is equal to x squared over 0 0.250 minus x. Right, and you can use a quadratic formula calculator um, if you want to. Uh, so you need to get it in the quadratic formula equation, whether you work it out by hand or you do it in your calculator. So, oh, I need to post a video on how you do that. Honestly, though, if you just like Google your specific calculator and then say program quadratic equation, it walks you through all the steps. But I'll try to remember to post a YouTube video of that as well. Okay, so if we rearrange this equation, in the quadratic equation, we end up with x squared plus 1.0 times 10 to the negative fifth, x minus 2.5 times 10 to the minus 6 equals 0. If you have opposite signs, I do. So say you have a negative x squared and a negative um, 1.0 times 10 to the minus 5. So if you have negative b and a negative a and then a positive c value, that's totally okay. It just means you took it over to the opposite side of the equation that I did. Okay. If you solve this in your calculator, what you're going to get is that x, well, it's two answers. The one of them is positive. It has to be the positive answer. x equals 0 0.0016. And pH equals negative log of that 0 0.0016. And pH is equal to 2.80. So what is true is that um, H3PO4, or what did we do this with? Oh, vitamin C, that's like pretty acidic, right? So that, that Ka, that initial Ka is actually fairly high for a weak acid. Um, that's getting down to like, you know, close to the ranges of pops, which are really acidic. Oh, sorry, sodas, if that's what you say here. We say pop in Michigan. Okay, so... We are going to cover the last thing for this video is acid strength and molecular structure. So I want to think about why some acids are stronger. Um, no, I just said vitamin C is actually a pretty strong weak acid. So why is it that some acids are stronger than others? Well, it has to do with their structure. And most of the time it has to do with how well they stabilize the negative charge that's left over after that proton is given somewhere. Okay, so let's think about a few examples um, of strong versus weak. Okay. So we have strong HNO3 versus HNO2. And we have H2SO4 versus H2SO3. One side is strong. Hopefully you know which one. This is our strong side. So their weak side. What's the difference? Well, hopefully you can look at both of those and tell me that it's just an oxygen, right? Strong be weak. Hmm. 
number of oxygens. Why does the number of oxygens matter at all? Okay. And I, I did want to point out that if you have these acids that have oxygens along with them, these are called oxoacids. Right, because they have oxygens in their acids, they're oxoacids. Just something you need to know. Um, but why are they strong? Why does the number of oxygens impact the strength of the acid so much? It impacts it because it allows it to stabilize that negative charge more effectively. So let's think about the difference. Um, let's look specifically at NO3, just because it's uh, not as hard to draw. So if I think about what happens when I go from HNO3 and it's going to dissociate, form H plus plus NO3 minus. What's true is that that negative charge is actually stabilized really, really well. So if you remember back to Lewis dot structures and resonance, if I draw the Lewis dot structure for this molecule, I have two negative charges on my oxygen. I have a positive charge on my nitrogen, leaving me with an overall one minus charge. And what's true is that these negative charges are evenly distributed throughout all of those oxygens. So it's super helpful. So we could think about the different resonance structures forming here. These electrons would collapse upon this bond. These electrons from this bond would go up. Double ended arrow to indicate resonance. And O. You still have that positive charge on that nitrogen. I can then take these electrons again, because remember a negative charge is a single pair, single lone pair of electrons. And that's always what does the moving. Okay? It's always the electrons that do the moving. You can't have a void space of a positive thing moving. Don't ever do that. Make sure you tell Brian that I taught you. <laughs> you take the electrons and you move the electrons. Okay, so the electrons collapse down onto that bond. And from this, oh, let's do a different one actually. Let's do, so you can see all three of them that show up. Let's do the electrons collapsing down here and then pushing this one back up. So you can see that any of those NO bonds and all of them have actually the same distributions of electrons around them. They're all shared through this resonance structure. We indicate resonance structures by giving these brackets around them. And you, those two electrons are evenly shared, um, or those negative charges are evenly shared between three oxygens. If I think about NO2, H plus, it's NO2 minus. I only have two oxygens to share that negative charge. So this structure, the N, O, O, minus side. So these electrons can come down, these ones can go back up. But there's also a lone pair on that nitrogen. So that nitrogen also isn't a positively charged thing, so it's not the, it's not stabilizing those negative charges that are on the exterior as well. So those are all your resonance structures. What I would expect you to be able to tell me is that, you know, oxo acids that have additional oxygens are um, more stable because they are better able to like um, distribute that negative charge throughout them. Now, if you like wanted to make my day, you would draw the Lewis dot structure, um, but I don't know how you're going to do that online, so probably not. But what you need to understand is that the structure and the ability of the compound to um, kind of handle the negative charge that's left over when you donate a proton is what impacts acid strength so, so much. Um, you can see that as well, I have acids and structures because um, electronegativity or the um, electronegativity of the central atom 
also impacts it a lot. That should make sense. What I'm talking about here is the compound's ability to stabilize a negative charge. So if something's really electronegative, it's going to be much better at stabilizing a negative charge, right? Um, in this situation, or in this picture, I guess, what we show is the structure here. And you can show that when we're at perchloric acid, which is a really strong acid, that negative charge gets distributed throughout that entire thing, so it's really diffuse and dispersed. Um, whereas if we have hypochlorous acid, this is a super tiny Ka, it's 2.9 times 10 to the negative eighth. It's so small because there isn't very good stabilization for that negative charge. Now, it is still an acid, because chlorine is a fairly electronegative element, right? So it can still stabilize it much more so than an element that wasn't as electronegative. So it's all about stabilizing that negative charge, okay? So I want you to think about um, this question. This is a top hat question. And rank the following with decreasing acid strength. So I want you to think about electronegativity. And I want you guys to think about what is different between each one of these. So hopefully you can see pretty quickly that the only difference is actually the central atom. Right? So what you need to do is look to a periodic table. Know that fluorine is your most electronegative element. I don't have fluorine on here, but fluorine actually is not good at all at stabilizing a negative charge because it doesn't form a stable ion. F minus is not a stable ion. Um, the reason for that is that fluorine is so tiny and hard and um, little that it just doesn't handle that negative charge very well. But other than that exception, things hold true. So if I think about arsenic, phosphorus, arsenic, antimony, and bismuth, they're all in group 15. They all go down a group. Bismuth is the furthest down, and then it goes antimony, arsenic, and phosphorus. What should be true is the phosphorus atom, right, the one that's closest to fluorine, it's going to be your most electronegativity negative and you're going to go through and think about that for each one of them okay cool and that will lead you to which one is the strongest i'm not going to tell you the answer for that one because i want you to be able to think about them i guess it will tell you the central atom is the only difference And I will also tell you that you should be looking for the most electronegative central atom. All right, that concludes this edition of my Zoom recordings. I hope you all enjoyed. <laughs>